gospel reading of our text for this morning's meditation. Please be seated. What a grand morning this is for the Reformation. Thank you, choir. I drank the little dance. As you praise the Lord. Reformation, six years ago, as you celebrated Reformation, you rededicated your sanctuary that had been renovated. What a blessing. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you one last time before Pastor Sarah again. He's like me, we just don't seem to get it right. I've retired twice, so we'll see how Pastor does. Reformation. Already the Senate is gearing up for next year for the 500th year of Reformation. It's starting officially next Sunday in St. Louis with a special service at the uh, Chapel of St. Timothy and Titus at Concordia Seminary with uh, President Matthew Harrison preaching and uh, beginning the kickoff, if you will, for a whole year of celebrating Reformation. Lord only knows how you'll celebrate Reformation next year with your new pastor. Hopefully by then you will have him housebroke. Or at least used to your unique ways in your ministry here. So as we celebrate 499 years of Reformation, you'll recall that it was initially, as Luther pounded those 95 theses on the door, uh, it was to say to the church Catholic at that time, Catholic meaning Little C Universal, that it needed to do some changing. It had lost sight of the gospel, of the gift of the, what Christ had done for us in giving us faith and salvation and mercy. Aren't those marvelous gifts to celebrate? And so the fight began between Luther and the Pope, who eventually put him into, which ended up putting Luther into protective custody because he had a bounty on his head. The fight didn't end there, though, because there'll be other reformers who come along, Swingley and John Calvin, and they'll start doing battle with one another uh, over the interpretation of scriptures. And as if that wasn't enough, you know us Lutherans, we're pretty good at fighting with one another. Amen? Oh, I thought I'd get a good amen on that one. We can fight over the darndest things. And, and even, even Melanchthon, who was one of the key figures in the Reformation, he and Luther went at it toward the end. I find it simply fascinating that they're both buried at the at the church in Wittenberg where the 95 Theses were pounded on the door. They were fighting. They're enemies. Are we still fighting some of those same battles? Are we still at war with the Catholics? Hmm. Because that's real interesting because we're in agreement with them regarding pro-life regarding marriage and a couple of years ago there was a document signed by the Lutheran World Federation along with the Roman Catholic Church on justification of course the Missouri Synod didn't sign it but 90% of the world Lutherans did I heard one time here recently uh, as I was guest preaching uh, one of the Parishioner said to me as I was go as he was coming out the door, he says, "You sure make the sign of, a, of the cross a lot. You look a little Catholic." I says, "No, give me a yarmulke. I look Jewish." <laughs> what about other Christians? Are we still doing battle with them, like the Baptist from John Calvin, once saved, always saved, and yet? The Baptist is one of the major denominations where we're in agreement about the inerrant word of God. Or how about the evangelicals? They stole it from us, you know. We are the true evangelicals. But like us, the evangelicals believe they have 
the right, the importance of giving the right answers when asking questions about God and defending the faith. So who are we reforming? The title of the sermon says, Reformation, me? Oh, no, I'm pretty good. You just ask me any old time, I'll tell you. And I'll do it even humbly, like Reverend Dr. Lucero does. Who are your enemies? Are we at war with Elka because of their stance regarding gay clergy and the choice of life, pro-choice? Who are your enemies in your life that, believe it or not, shape us? How we defend ourselves against our enemies. Who do you fear? As we said in our confession and from the first commandment, we are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Our first reading from Revelation talks about giving, fearing God and giving Him the glory and worshiping Him. Have you ever felt like God was your enemy? Or at least wasn't there? Or didn't seem to be too interested in what's going on in your life? Luther certainly had those struggles with God. And he was pretty honest with, with God in terms of him being his enemy. He would flog himself, as you all know, trying to get rid of that sin so he could stand righteously before God on the day of judgment. And as he learned from the book of Romans, it was Christ who's done it all. The, thus the phrase, I'm my own worst enemy as I deal with my sins. Our first re reading reminds us that we are to be worshiping Him. Is worshiping happening daily for us? When you confessed your sins this morning, before, and Pastor gave us a little time to reflect on it, I had a number of sins. I wish he had given me another couple minutes. When you're confessing your sins and you, you hear a pastor announce to you the word of forgiveness, are you celebrating the reforming that God is doing in your life with your sins? That they've been removed, you are free? Free at last? Free in the truth of the gospel? How many of you ever, after you've heard a pastor turn around and confess you and make the sign of the cross, you felt like getting up and doing a little dance? You've never felt that, have you? If you had more hair, you might. You see, confession is more than just confessing our sins. As I was confessing this morning, I was confessing, Lord, I'm grieving. I'm dying. I have anxiety. I, I worry. Did I miss anybody? You see, confessing is more than just our sins. It's the recognition of my total dependency upon God. And that includes all of my emotions all of my thoughts, all of my actions. The gospel invites us then to recognize to be totally dependent upon God. Anyone need to do some reforming about that? Because I sure like to depend on myself. I got it figured out, right God? Oy vey. I have a flat-headed angel in heaven in case you didn't know that. Oy vey, there he goes again. And so as we confess our, 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 our sins, we also confess our total recognition upon on God and Christ Jesus through faith. Paul talks about that in, his, in, in our second reading. The Greek word for faith is, what is it, pastor? 
pistis. In Greek, it's a verb. But when we translate it, we make it a noun. Like it's static. It really should be translated faithing. I'm in action, I'm in process, I'm in progress. And that's different than faith as a noun. That's belief, that's intellectual assent. Is, is my faith just intellectual assent? Can I move it 12 inches from my head to my sprachne? Y'all know what your sprachne is? You told them that, Pastor? It's your innards. That's where your, your soul is. That's where God's Spirit dwells within you. To be in action. To be about your Father's business. And, and, and that's why Jesus came. He was about His Father's business. It was faith that Christ had in the promises of the Father that gave us salvation. He believed in action as he went to that cross taking on the tyranny of sin, death, and the devil, the big three, and dying. He trusted that the Father would raise him from the dead. He was faithing through the cross to his descent into hell and to the resurrection. Let's celebrate Woohoo! Don't you ever get excited? Boy, you guys look like you're ready to be woken up here. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. And as the Lord gives us faith, then we are invited, as the gospel is, which is the focus of our meditation this morning, the freedom that we have in that faith thing, in that action of what God has done and continues to do for you. Excuse me, for you and I. As he went through that cross and enabled us then to be free, he, he frees me not only from my sins, which we confess at the beginning of our divine service, but he also re he, he frees me from my virtues. If you remember early in this sermon, I said I'm a pretty good guy. So, what's one of your virtues there, Pastor? This is kind. He's kind. He's humbly kind. He frees us from our virtues. And one of the virtues that we Lutherans kind of pride ourselves in is true the true understanding of doctrine. Here I stand, I can do no other, Luther would say. But it's not our doctrine that saves us. It's Christ's faith and the faith He gives us in Him that gives us salvation, that we are faithing, that indeed we are free, not only from our sins, but from our, uh, from our vices, but from our virtues, that I've got it right. Because I don't have it right. Just about when I think i got it figured out, the Lord goes, whoo, watch this. And off we go. He's taking me on a faithing journey. to be in the freedom He gives me in Christ Jesus. To love and serve and obey. Uh, may I borrow your bulletin there? You know. Thank you. I'll give it back, Pastor, because you've got all the answers underlined here. We're all about doing some reformation, some reforming of our faith life, our faithing life, and maybe you need to think about, is it time to reform your purpose, your mission? You're going to get a new pastor. We'll talk about that in a moment. But do you need to reform your mission, your purpose statement? Emmanuel Lutheran Church exists for the express purpose of bringing men, women, and children into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, building men, women, and children up in the gospel, and sending men, women, and children out as witnesses to that gospel. Do you need to rework your, your, your mission statement, reform it, to make disciples through the sharing of God, of the word, baptizing and teaching as the Lord has commanded, 
and I might add the phrase, if I may be so bold, and to receive frequently the sacrament of the altar for the forgiveness of sins. Woohoo! One of these days, thank you, Pastor, one of these days, I'm going to have the joy of watching somebody walk away from the communion altar and they're going, all right, I'm free from my sins. I'm faith in a way. I'm moving with the Lord. If you do that, make sure I see it. And then call 911 because I'll probably need an ambulance. <laughs> Reformation. What it needs me to be reformed. I mentioned that part of my confession this morning is grieving. Because over the years that you've had Pastor and Sarah with you, I've been invited to preach here, to share a word and sacrament with you. I may not get to do that again. Your new pastor may take a look at me and say, you're really a pastor? Say, yeah, the Lord's full of surprises, isn't he? He'll use anybody in his gospel. So I'm going to do, I'm, I'm reforming, I'm rethinking about what my relationship's going to be like with you all. But I'm trusting, I'm faithing, that if I don't get to share God's word with you here again, on this earth, I'll get to share it with you in heaven. With all the angels and archangels and all the saints who've gone before us. You're going to be doing some reforming. On November the 13th, you'll be saying farewell to Pastor Lucero. You'll start rethinking your relationship with him, and he'll be yet another retired pastor who stays on as a member here. What will that be like for you all? What thinking needs to change? What part of your attitude will be different? Because now you're going to be making room, uh, some reforming for a new pastor on the following Sunday who will be installed. Have you already started thinking about, well, what's this going to be like? Is he going to, be, is he going to meet our expectations? Will he walk on water like Pastor Lucero did some of the time? Only when he knew where the rocks were. There was a lot of rocks. <laughs> Pastor Lucero is going to be reforming along with his family because he's going to be in a different role. In fact, he and I have been talking about that, of the changes that he needs to make. Not only in his head, but in his heart and, and how the Lord may be using him in this next chapter in his life. And, and, and your new pastor will show up and you've, you're already getting some reformation going of thinking what that's going to be like and what it's going to be like when he gets here. Will I approve of him? Will he approve of us? You see, we think of our faith and faithing as individuals, but it's also a community of faith. You're a community of faith, free in the gospel when you come to this altar this morning and receive the body and blood of Christ. You are connected, so you're responsible and responding to one another. Do you need to reform the way you think about each other? Does there need to be a confession and a healing that you might have a grudge against? None of you carry any grudges in here, do you? We'll have another confession, Pastor. As you think about how God is reforming your life, it happens to us, Luther says, daily in our baptism. As your feet touch the cold floor, Luther would say, you begin your day in the name, join with me, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And you are free indeed. Let's celebrate. And all of God's children said, Amen. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Please stand as we sing the creed. I guess you